But welcome to our first talk of the term. Um, I'm Sophie, treasurer of the Christian Cool Society, and um, I guess today's not about me, today's about <laughs> um, decolonizing philology. Um, so the format of our talk today is going to be about 40 to 45 minutes, um, just listening to Krishnan, um, and then afterwards we'll have a brief Q&A session. But I guess before we go on, um, just I think everybody is muted and has cameras off at the moment, but if if you do not, um, please make sure that's a thing so everything runs smoothly. Um, much appreciated. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, sorry, we're also recording the talk. Um, so for anybody who cannot make it today, um, it'll be available on our YouTube channel in the near future. Okay, time to introduce our speaker. <laughs> so Krishnan Ram Prasad is a final year PhD candidate in classics at the University of Cambridge. His research focuses on the reconstruction of relative clauses in Proto-Indo-European using minimalist syntactic theory. From April 20, 2022, he will be a postdoctoral research assistant in the theoretical and applied linguistics section, working on PIE syntax. Before his PhD, he read an MPhil in classics and a BA in linguistics, both at Cambridge. He has also written on critical themes in classics, including an article in Adelon and a forthcoming handbook chapter on the role of comparative philology in critical ancient world studies. All right, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for that introduction and to Ray and uh, everyone uh, at the Christian Cole Society for inviting me to uh, deliver this, uh, this talk and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so, uh, you know who I am and uh, today I will be talking not about relative clauses in proto and european but about critical perspectives in comparative philology, which is a fairly generic title uh, because I left myself some wiggle room to decide what I was going to talk about today. Um, so, an outline of the talk, this talk um, is as follows. Um, I'm going to start with some preliminaries. Uh, this will be just a, a couple of things about definitions of terms that I'll be using, um, but also sort of the motivation for us to even be taking a critical approach towards comparative uh, philology and, and, and why this sort of thing matters. Um, but the bulk of this talk, um, I'm going to dedicate to um, what I call uh, the comparative curriculum. Um, what I mean by that is specifically the way we approach and the way we teach and the way we learn ancient languages within the kind of uh, disciplinary paradigm of comparative philology, um, as I'll define in the preliminaries. Um, and that will be, as I say, what I talk about for most of this talk. Um, but I will also, um, towards the end, situate um, the, the kind of proposals um, I'm making for, for this comparative curriculum within the broader context of comparative philology within um, a more decolonized and more anti-racist uh, university and um, indeed classics. Uh, so, yes, without further ado, let's move on. So in terms of preliminaries, I want to get this out of the way because um, I've had to talk, I've talked uh, in various uh, kind of um, positions um, about critical approaches to comparative philology. And I think that different people do approach philology with slight different ideas um, of, of what it means. Um, and in, in the, the forthcoming handbook chapter that, um, that, that Sophie mentioned, um, I kind of make a distinction between what I call philology one and philology two. Now, philology one, um, th these are contemporary meanings. I'm not going to bore you with the etymology. Philology one, which is still a very prevalent uh, use of the term, especially in North America, is a very general approach towards studying, maybe I might specify historical texts, but it doesn't necessarily come with a particular motivation for studying those texts. It may be to develop a critical edition, it may be to have a clear understanding of an author's philosophical intentions, um, it may be any number of things. Um, that's not the philology I'll be talking about today. What I'll be talking about today um, is what I define as philology too. I define this uh, quite broadly as the scientific study of the language of historical texts. Um, I took the time to look at um, how uh, the University of Oxford defines it, and I very much like this definition, that philology is the study of the systematic behavior of and developments within a language or language family over time. So with these definitions of philology, we're talking in quite specific terms um, about what is broadly a part of um, the kind of field of linguistics, um, which is you know, a kind of scientific or empirical study. And uh, the Oxford definition comes with the added thing um, within that of we are looking at specific languages or language families. Um, and that is that is a sort of that is the kind of working definition of philology that I'll be discussing today. 
And within that definition of phonology, philology, um, we may then also introduce what the comparative part means, and that introduces this concept of reconstruction. So I would consider a working definition, not an exhaustive definition of comparative philology to be the reconstruction of a proto-language that is a shared but unattested ancestor language via the empirical comparison of historical texts in related languages. So this is basically what you might call reconstructive linguistics or comparative linguistics. Um, I'm going to stick with the term comparative philology because that's kind of the most, it, it stood the test of time um, as, 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 a, as a name for the discipline. I'm not particularly precious about it. Um, but Okay, within the context of classics, when we talk about the reconstruction of a proto-language, we are talking about um, Proto-Indo-European. Um, there are plenty of other proto-languages, um, but Proto-Indo-European being the hypothesized uh, ancestor of, among other languages, Latin and Greek. So that's one set of preliminaries. That's what I mean when I talk about comparative philology. Um, the other set of preliminaries is why race, and I haven't actually mentioned this um, because there are many ways we could talk about critical or decolonial perspectives in any field. I'm gonna be talking uh, mainly about race today and why do we care about race and racism in comparative philology? Um, well, the first thing to understand, especially if you're coming from the perspective of general linguistics, is that comparative philology really emerges. In fact, it can only really emerge as a discipline in a context of what I call rampant colonialism. Um, it sort of begins, it, it sort of it sort of crawls its way into existence in the 18th century, but really takes flight in the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, which was um, very much not a good time, as if there ever was any good time, to be um, uh, colonized. Uh, so that history is not something which disappears um, when we suddenly wake up and it's 2022 and we don't technically consider a lot of uh, the kind of uh, languages that are studied in Indo-European linguistics to be colonized um, anymore, but it is very much something that, that, that lives on. And more broadly, and in this case, I'm, I'm very grateful um, that Kresha Vukovic gave a talk just one week ago to the London Classes of Colour, uh, uh, giving a, a lot more information than I can provide today about how that kind of Indo-European mythology and comparative philology as part of that is implicated in and shot through with imperialist ideology. Um, and this is something which it's not just that, oh, it so happens that comparative philology happened to kind of come into existence when people happen to be, when Europeans happen to be colonizing the world. It's very much an, a, a story that is intertwined. Um, and um, I think it's talk, if it's not available yet, will be available online. So um, absolutely do go, do go and seek that out. More plainly, and it, I think this is less interesting because you could really say this of almost any discipline. So this isn't something that particularly pertains to comparative philology, but um, there are some really bad people um, that have been comparative philologists. You know, you've had um, Nazis, you've had white supremacists, you know, and not just out of, aside from Orientalists and colonialists. So there's, there's a lot of uh, individuals which, um, you know, at various platforms, various people have, have kind of taken up, um, uh, taken to task for um, their beliefs. Um, and, and that is something which, again, all of these things are which are, are things which a critical approach to comparative philology has to encompass is a consideration of these, of these factors. Um, but a, a point also which um, I, I, I would love, love to have made in detail, but really 20, min 20 minutes on the background of uh, relative pronouns in Proto-Indo-European probably wasn't the best use of my time. But this kind of racist and imperialist ideology isn't just something which you see in political discourse informed by comparative philology or cross-cultural comparison or comparative mythology, but in linguistics. And you do have linguistic theories which I consider to be undermined by um, a particular kind uh, of colonialist uh, racist mindset. So all of these things are what I consider to be on what we might call it intellectual level or on a research level, um, or just on a, on, a, on a kind of very much intradisciplinary level, things that need to be addressed, criticized, um, contextualized if you're a student, um, in terms of why comparative philology is not this kind of, um, you know, clean slate. There's a lot of stuff um, that, that, that is bad, um, that is in the past and, and of which continues to affect the present. So that is the context in which I would say, look, race and racism, these are things that on a broad scale and in the context of a critical approach to, to the discipline, absolutely need to be addressed as much as if you were doing art history or philosophy or whatever else. But 
um, as I say, that's not really what I'm going to be talking about today, because my main focus is on the comparative curriculum. What I'm ultimately going to do here is try and propose, well, OK, it's all very good talking about how terrible the past is and how the, the terribleness continues to the present. Um, but what might a slightly less terrible present and future look like? So um, let's think about Indo-European studies, right? I'll put two things up here, um, which are two ways of visualizing the spread of uh, ancient uh, Indo-European languages in terms of uh, their, their spread across space. I haven't given the map here um, because I don't consider it to be particularly uh, relevant per se, but um, you can see that they kind of spread um, across time and across space here. Um, so on the left, you have um, what I refer to as a phylogeny, a family tree, um, where you would probably basically consider Proto-Indo-European to be this sort of node up here, um, which is ultimately um, has these descendants, which are attested on the tree. That's not even a complete tree, as far as I can see, I can't see the Germanic languages up there, but it's quite a lot of languages which have different levels of interrelation between them. On the right hand side, you have a very helpful, actually reasonably unusual way of presenting um, the, the sort of relative ages of attest attestation of Indo-European languages, but you'll see that some like Hittite are, you know, early second millennium BCE, um, while there are uh, other language families whose earliest attestations are only a few hundred years ago. So there's a whole lot of spread, right? Um, so if you think of Indo-European studies as something that emerges, if Proto-Indo-European is a language that emerges by the comparison of these different branches, then comparative philology at a disciplinary level is something that also emerges um, out of um, a set of different fields. And uh, this is where, if, if I was slightly more technically uh, able, I would have gotten a snap poll here, although given the context that I'm giving this lecture, um, I might preempt the answer that we come to comparative philology primarily through, through classics, right? I've shown you that we've got this broad tree, but within that tree, it's really classics that brings a lot of people into comparative philology. It's how we kind of discover it. Not everyone. I myself came through linguistics. That was what my first degree was, um, which is, again, a different thing because then the question is, well, how do you get into linguistics? And, and that can kind of play into classics as well. Um, but setting aside those two sort of reasonably obvious pathways, there are other ways that you can enter um, comparative philology. There is the field which um, Oxford gets away with still calling Oriental studies. Cambridge is marginally better in calling it Asian and Middle East studies. But the point being, the area studies of um, parts of the world, which are east um, of uh, Western Europe, um, where you do have ancient Indo-European languages attested. So Hittite um, is a clear example, which is attested in, in Anatolia, um, and of course, um, uh, Iranian and, uh, and uh, Indic languages like Sanskrit and Avestan, which also kind of fall under this purview. So these are also part of Indo-European studies. Um, it's also uh, not unheard of for people to come into Indo-European studies from English via Old English or um, Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic. So doing Celtic languages and comparative Germanic philology, right? These are all ways where you're getting into the notion of doing historic, doing philology, not necessarily comparative philology, but philology definition two, which ultimately ties into the broader Indo-European picture. And um, this is one of the things that I've always really liked about uh, comparative philology. It's the feature of the discipline that it really is this, it's either however you want to make the metaphor, draw the metaphor, it either emerges from, or it kind of is the collaboration between all of these kind of different other fields, um, which, is, which lends, it, lends itself to, um, especially in the context of us trying to reimagine a slightly more global and, and, and less uh, kind of hegemonic um, uh, Eurocentric vision of what classics is, we would think that this is a feature we, would sh we should capitalize on, right? There is an inherent pluralism um, in the kind of comparative study of languages. That's something which I think we could probably do something with. Um, and so how might we do that? Well, we have to ask ourselves a question let's say we've got all of these, uh, these languages, how are we going to decide from scratch? Forget that you've studied classics or linguistics or ASNAP or whatever it is, how are you going to decide what languages are going to, we're going to study in order to do if our end goal is Proto-Indo-European? We'll think about several factors, right? One of the first things that's going to be important, and there's a reason why I included the table from uh, uh, James Clarkson's book, is that the date of attestation of a language does matter 
for its importance for proto-Indo-European reconstruction. This is from the kind of reasonably basic, in fact, probably oversimplified um, generalization that the older a language is, the closer it will be in terms of its structure to the proto language, right? So Latin is going to be closer to proto Indo European than probably uh, modern French, right? So date of attestation is something that matters. The older we can, we can go, the better. That's going to take us kind of closer. Another thing that we will consider, um, and this is a little bit more technical, um, is the phylogenetic position. That's a fancy way of saying. Um, you saw on that uh, phylogeny, on the family tree, that some languages are kind of clustered together and others are a bit further apart. So if we can say, oh, we want to do three languages, you know, we could choose Latin, Oscan and Umbrian. These are all reasonably closely related and, and they'll get us to some proto-language, but it might not get us all the way up to proto-Indo-European. So we probably do want a spread. We might say we want, okay, Latin does one branch, we might want another branch from another language from another branch to kind of give that broader perspective. There's also the size of the corpus. You could, I imagine, start doing Indo-European studies by doing Celtiberian and Phrygian, um, but you know the, the course will end reasonably quickly because there's not a huge amount of it, at least not a huge amount that we can actually understand it and use. So clearly we want languages that are well attested as well as attested at an early stage. And then the more practical, well, the size of corpus is also practical, but possibly the most practical thing if we were building a university course is to have the availability of materials. And this is something which is improving with time, um, but there, it is manifestly the case that some languages just have more people who can teach them, more resources that they can draw upon, and more availability of things like dictionaries and grammars than others. So clearly the availability of materials is something that we would want to factor in. It is no surprise then that Latin and ancient Greek are very likely to come out on top, even if we started from scratch. Um, you know, if we go back to these diagrams and, and you see where Latin and Greek are on them, they are, in terms of the phylogeny, they're in different branches, right? Greek and Latin are reasonably far apart. They're also pretty well attested. Uh, and, uh, sorry, they're, pretty, they're attested pretty early on. Um, so they will come out, I, I said almost on top. I mean, there are certainly other contenders, right? So you have Hittite, which is certainly older, the oldest in terms of attestation. Um, it's got a pretty big corpus. It's not as big as the Latin or the Greek corpus, but it's pretty big. Um, and you do have, um, you know, some very usable textbooks. I have one sitting here. It's, it's easy enough to at least get a basic grasp, um, uh, certainly much easier than it was, say, even 20 years ago. Um, so there are alternatives. So we might consider, OK, we'll make some decision, which I won't preempt now, on which languages we're going to say, OK, these give us the spread that we want in order to do Indo-European studies. The next set of questions, once we've decided what languages would be a useful way um, of doing it, is how we approach this language. And this is where, once again, I I'd like you to clear your mind of Latin and Greek, and especially if you're a classic student, what your approach to those languages has been, and consider the way Sanskrit, I take this as a case study, I'll use Sanskrit, I talk about it a lot, um, it's obviously something that uh, you, it, will, it will be obvious to you that this is something that I have a lot to say about because it is quite central to my own research and my own experience with book philology. Uh, but it's not, it's, only, it's not necessarily representative, but it's something that we can, that we can start with. If you come from classics, uh, I can't say I know in detail the way this works in Oxford, but certainly it's the way that it, 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 that it does happen elsewhere. And it makes sense. You'll have done Latin and Greek, and you come to do comparative philology, and you have to encounter Sanskrit, and you normally do that via a text or via a small sample of the text. And almost always, the text that you would focus on for the first thing you ever do in Sanskrit in a comparative context, coming out of classics, is to look at the Rig Veda, which is um, a, a collection of religious poetry, and it's it's very old. Um, it's an, it's an oral tradition, so we don't have a specific date, but it's somewhere around 1,500, 1,200 BC. It's old, right? It's very old. Um, and for that reason, it sort of makes sense that we would go for it. And indeed, the language from a, from a kind of structural perspective is very different from the language of what might refer, be referred to in quite loaded terms as classical Sanskrit or epic Sanskrit, which is, you know, we're, we're talking at least a thousand years later than this. Um, for the linguists involved there, the linguists uh, who are particularly interested, you can see there that there are these reasonably major structural differences, so that if we want to do reconstruction, 
absolutely Vedic is where, where, where we want to start, right? But if we take that same approach and we applied it to Latin and Greek, where would we start? What would be the kind of text that we would engage with? So if you take Latin, you might start with some of the older comedy, um, so authors like Plautus and Terence. You also have archaic inscriptions, things like the Duenos Vars inscription um, or Prinestai Fibula, which I, I believe is real now. Again, um, there are archaic inscriptions. There is, you know, there is a fairly substantial amount of Latin, which is clearly pre-classical in, in some, some general sense. And of course, in Greek, if anything, it's it's even more obvious you have the epic poetry of Homer, potentially Hesiod, um, and then of course um, the whole other kettle of fish, which is Mycenaean, and and archaic alphabetic inscriptions, Nestor's cup, and things like that, which you have in, in Greek as well. So imagine that you've never read Latin before, you've never encountered the language except in a very general sense, and then you're reading Plautus, so you've never done Greek, and then you just go straight for Mycenaean. Now, from a classics perspective. If you're not already kind of committed to the cause of doing protein European construction, this is something which might seem uh, not necessarily the wisest choice, right? What about all of this other stuff? All of this other, all of this other Latin and Greek material. Why haven't you go? You can't, you know, you can't just jump all of these hurdles and go straight for Plautus unless you've done some Virgil, right? Surely, right? Or surely, or some Cicero, something, right? When I talk about the availability of materials these are the authors that are then more likely to be based on rather than the, than the sort of most archaic ones. But of course, that argument could be given for Sanskrit too, right? There's, the corpus is even larger, right? The tradition is, uh, you know, absolutely there and as, and, 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 and as kind of uh, continuous and something that, that you could very much, and, and, and if you are studying Sanskrit in a uh, sort of oriental studies capacity, or if you're, you know, I dare say, even if you're studying Sanskrit in India, then these are the kind of texts that you're more likely to start with rather than go straight for the Rig Veda. That is more like Homer in that it's something which you might consider to be important and influential, but in the terms of your interaction with the language, it comes at a later stage. So what this starts digging into is the slightly more philosophical question of why we read texts, okay? Now, in the context of this talk, the first reason is, well, it's Obviously, we read text to reconstruct proto and European. Um, sure, and that leads to the, the kind of considerations that I have uh, suggested. But clearly, even philologists are not kind of so single-minded as for that to be purely the only reason that we read texts. Right? There must be some else, something else, right? Maybe to learn about our past or their past, depending on um, the uh, languages you're studying and, and your own identity politics. Um, maybe to study equally and you know these are the kind of talking points you get people say well why does classics matter well you know look at how it influences or has influenced and continues to influence the world we live in um there's also the the slightly outlandish proposition that we just read these texts because they're nice um or that they're actually pleasant to read um the fact of the matter is probably that we do um do read text for all of these reasons and there are plenty more right um, there are plenty more what is important, uh, this isn't just me sort of musing for no, to, to no end here. What matters when we actually look at, at these reasons we read the texts is that the, the reason we have for reading a text influences the way we read it. Or for example, I put learn it, that should mean learn the language. Um, so for example, this is where we start tapping into a much broader debate within classics about the role of different ways of accessing a text, right? Depending on why you're reading a text, you may make use of a given translation, or if not a translation, maybe a, a, a linguistic gloss where you don't get given a translation, but you know you have a morphological pass, so you don't, so you can work your way through it. Equally, there's of course commentaries, and then at a broader level, if you're you're reading a text because, you, for example, you, you you know you want to actually engage with the arguments that a particular author is making. Clearly, therefore, secondary literature is going to be part of uh, how you uh, engage with. Um, and read a text. So, bringing it back to comparative philology, we may assume, in fact, this is an assumption which I'm going to say is necessary for the kind of uh, rethinking of the discipline that I'm advocating for. Whatever we decide our values are, um, they should alter, or our reasons for reading a text are, they should probably apply 
the same way to every language. Once we've decided which languages to study, then our motivations for reading those texts should ultimately be the same. Clearly, however, given the fact of the matter and the way that we do, way we do end up doing comparative philology, we don't have the same approach to every language that, that we do. I mean, some people might, but overwhelmingly, and at least within the very narrow UK context of Oxford and Cambridge, it is overwhelmingly the case that we do approach languages in different ways in comparative philology, and it's not a random way that we do that. We have a very specific way of approaching Latin and ancient Greek, even if we end up doing comparative philology at a research level where that doesn't play out in quite the same way. At, an, at a curriculum level, we do have this, um, this different, dif differentiation between you know, the fact that <laughs> you do read Cicero and Lysias and Plato, and you don't read Ramanuja and Kalidasa necessarily if you're coming from classics, right? And so that's why we have to kind of think, well, what is this broader educational context that leads us to this state of affairs? And what would it look like if we didn't have that state of affairs? So um, this is going to be the next thing I talk about, um, which basically is, OK, let's say that we did kind of have this kind of slightly more, uh, slightly less, uh, or, slightly more neutral approach or a more egalitarian approach to the languages that we do study how would we actually go about learning them? If we're going to say, okay, you don't need to do it in the way that's prescribed by the literature kind of group within your faculty of classics or department of classics, what does a comparative uh, linguistic curriculum look like? Well, clearly one of the things that we focus on a lot in comparative linguistics is linguistic structure. And I put especially phonology and morphology here because uh, I think it's worth noting uh, uh, that a lot of the things which are quite basic and important in comparative philology, and also not particularly complex, require or, or are often treated as slightly unnecessary or nitpicking in the context of a more literary focused um, education. So an example of this is, you know, for example, the pronunciation of uh, aspirated consonants in Greek, right? If it's phi or pi, right, or theta and theta, right? I'm not even doing the vowels right. Um, but the point being, to a comparative philologist, it is a matter of categorical importance and indeed categorical simplicity to say that these are voiceless aspirated stops. And that matters and it's easy enough to explain, but they clearly aren't uh, voiceless fricatives. So they're pronounced as th, they're not pronounced as th. Now, if you're doing some kind of reading class, that is precisely the kind of thing where you say, look, the teacher is pronouncing it as theta, then we'll say theta and we move on. It's not something that matters to us. And um, so linguistic structure, things like that, small things like that, which see, might seem like nitpicking, are reasonably straightforward if you're coming at it from a linguistic comparative perspective. Right? Similarly, variation is something especially, uh, I keep being brought back to Greek here because you, know, you sort of come crashing in um, with Attic, right? Uh, with fifth century Attic as being, fifth century BC Attic as being what Greek is. And then, oh, right, Herodotus, okay, right, that's a, another thing. Oh, oh, okay, right, oh, there's a correlates. This is a slightly different variety. So, you know, these are the sort of things where it's, again, you sort of start from a locus of what's important and you reach out and that's complex. Variation is complex. From the linguist's point of view, actually, you know, it's more helpful to know that the Doric form is histami because that's actually helpful from a comparative perspective, rather than learning that the Attic Ionic form is histami and then having to kind of say, oh, okay, well, there was this sound change that took place where long alpha becomes eta in ancient Greek, these sorts of things, right? So again, you know, if you're coming from a comparative perspective, it's simple. If you're coming from another perspective, it might seem, and it might well be, arguably, uh, just unnecessary complication. That's without going on about social linguistic variation, regional variation, uh, sorry, diachronic variation. Um, these are all things which from a linguistic perspective and from a comparative perspective are super important. That is where the excitement lies. Um, and it's also not inherently complex. You just need to make space to discuss it in, in sort of reasonably good um, and clear terms. Of course, there's correspondence. Um, you know, when, when I'm teaching language, uh, when I'm teaching Latin or, or, or Greek, I set, tend to find that some students think in the same way that I do, which is where if you're struggling with vocab, a phrase say, if you can't remember the Greek word, knowing that it corresponds to a Latin word is helpful. For other language learners, it's just like, well, we're doing Greek, so 
introducing a Latin vocab item is just an unnecessarily le unnecessary level of complication. It doesn't matter because we focus on the language at hand, right? Clearly, from a comparative perspective, correspondence is basically the, the absolute fundament of the comparative method. So correspondence and vocab that corresponds, which is cognate in two different languages, it's got to be at the center of the way you do it. And then more broadly, and I would say this because of my background, just a little bit more time, maybe even independently of the, the ancient language we're studying, just getting a, a grasp on the kind of theoretical things behind what is a phony, what is a sound change, you know, what is a language, all of these kind of things are things that matter when you're doing comparative philology in a way that they might not in other contexts, and reasonably so. How do we make space for all of this stuff? Well, um, we don't really need to produce translations, certainly not unseen tra translations under timed conditions that are handwritten. That's not something that the comparative philologist, I think, needs to do in order to do comparative philology. Similarly, memorizing vocabulary. I mean, it's good to be able to make connections quickly, but there's really no reason for you not to have a dictionary. If anything, you know, in, in the context of my thesis, uh, which I'm coming towards the end of now, which is why it's at the front of my mind, you know, even if I know what a word means, I'm going to look it up because it's actually, firstly, more important that you double check than that you show off how much you've memorized. But also, you know, these kind of resources point you towards useful comparanda a lot of the time, and, and they can give you that kind of extra perspective. So if anything, you should be encouraged to look up words more than you should be encouraged to memorize them and never look them up again. Um, Practical criticism. Um, this is a bit of a black box for me because I didn't do an undergraduate degree in classics, but this kind of being given, let's say, 20 lines of a given uh, set text and having to kind of give a little, give a little kind of spiel about why it's interesting, why the author does this, and, and what you know, what the kind of literary effect of, 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 a, of a given construction is, that sort of thing. Don't need to do that. Um, and crucially, this is probably the most important thing I've put up on there. The notion of a canon, the notion of things which you just have to study, things which are important, things which are why we, why, or things which manifest the way classics shapes way, the way we live now, or shapes the way that literature is developed. It just, it just doesn't matter. It simply doesn't matter. There is simply no reason for there to be a canon. The only canon of any sort that you could claim to have any value in a comparative context is one in which we take into consideration those factors I mentioned earlier about date of attestation, phylogeny, et cetera, and then decide, okay, well, look, you really do have to do Hittite. It's right there. It's the oldest attested into European language. You know, you should do that. But that's not because of any kind of cultural value that's ascribed to it. And it's certainly not to do with in tradition. The language has only been deciphered, you know, just about a hundred years, less than. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot, there's a, you know, there's a lot about the canon which we could just get rid of. And that's one of the things which I would say, you know, comparative philology can help with that. It's, you know, not just kind of dusty, dusty professors with, you know, extensive old 19th century books on grammar. There's, there's progress um, in, in this comparative curriculum. And the conclusion I would draw from all this on a broader scale is that language learning is not a linear progression. It's not, I have Latin, I don't have Latin, I have this much, I have this many years what we consider to be useful depends on the application, right? And for this reason, philologists, as I've just made the point, they benefit from the ongoing reconsideration of language requirements in classics. Now, it's not a fantasy that we could have this approach to language teaching because we just did it, or I mentioned how we do it with Vedic Sanskrit, where if you've got Latin and Greek, let's say, from having done classics in whatever capacity, then you'd have to do Vedic. We don't say, okay, put you the window, you have to do the alphabet, right? Because the texts are all in transliteration. So why bother learning the alphabet, right? That's there and that's fine. That's absolutely reasonable if you're doing comparative linguistics. You don't have to go and do the Mahabharata. It's great, you should for fun, but you don't have to necessarily, well, actually, there's some question on dialect mixture in Sanskrit, which means that actually epic Sanskrit could have some value in, for, for some particular value for reconstructing. But the point is that you don't read the Mahabharata because it's a canonical text, because it's such a phenomenal feat of human endeavor. For the comparative purposes, you would only ever read it because of comparative interest, right? And this is where what I'm broadly that I haven't used the word yet, but um, I'm sure some people are thinking it. What this is, which is a core part of doing decolonial work, is decentering, right? You have to be ready to decenter Latin and ancient Greek and 
their respective speech communities in the study of comparative philology. Right? You have to be able to say, well, look, if we, if we can take this approach to well, Sanskrit or Hittite or Tocharian or Avestan, um, you know, or Old Church Slavonic, whatever it is, right? Well, that's a slightly less good example because the text is more limited, but um, these kind of languages where there's quite a lot of material, um, if we can have that kind of purely targeted philological kind of language learning, which doesn't depend on, 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 on the, the, the old canon, we should allow the same to be the case for Latin and Greek. Now, I put one, I don't have, I don't include many disclaimers in my talks, but I should include this disclaimer that it really, it really mustn't be understood as, as some kind of abandonment of the old classical paradigm. By all means, have an education in which, you know, you have to read Cicero and Ovid and, and Virgil before you can read Plautus or whatever. Um, but the point is that what that cannot be, what comparative philology cannot treat that as, is some kind of central way of, of, of getting people into comparative philology, right? You, you have to actually allow for the possibility that someone might have done as many years with as literary a kind of upbringing um, in Sanskrit or, or in Anatolian languages or in, you know, comparative Germanic philology, who then when they want to come and do, uh, uh, come into European studies, they will want to just say, right, we'll take the Plautus, we'll take the inscriptions, and they don't, won't have to, you know, wade their way through, uh, you, you know, uh, whatever kind of canonical text you decide um, is, is important, right? Um, so the cognate fields I've mentioned at the start, and you could probably actually bend those a bit further, you've got to say, well, rather than treating classics as the kind of major pathway into comparative philology, it's one of many, and that means that you shouldn't have to say, oh, well, this is what a Latin and Greek education looks like, you know, you can just kind of pick the rest as you choose. We can also pick Latin and Greek, and you can also have a very literary education in another language, but you still have to say, look, Latin and Greek can be accessed in exactly the same way as we did with Sanskrit. Okay, oh gosh, right. Now this brings me to um, my final kind of, uh, I've got 10 minutes to go. This brings me to my kind of final bit of the talk. So as I say, we started with what are the kind of very basic on the face reasons that comparative philology is at all part of a critical discussion, right? And, and those are sort of there and they're reasonably straightforward. And I focused a lot of time on, okay, decentering, somehow decolonial, right? But I mean, it's easy to lose track in, in kind of what I'm saying. I mean, what I'm saying has generally been just informed by not trying to be particularly fixing a, a particular problem, but just saying, well, look, if we just, if we just were less hung up on the, the tradition as it stands, what would we do? But there is this broader context for um, comparative philology, which the kind of decentering that I'm suggesting, which as I say, is motivatable on its own terms, it does absolutely play into a broader context. And this is what I, what I dedicate the last bit of the talk to. And I, I say here that comparative philology is a discipline independently of classics, right? independently of classics, because as, as I've just said, classics has to be kind of decentered in the study of comparative philology. So therefore, independently, you've got to think of how you fit into that exterior context that discriminates against um, scholars of color. And yes, this encompasses the stuff I mentioned at the beginning, the intellectual stuff and doing research on uh, racist ideology and comparative philology and, and, and dismantling it. And, it, and it, it obviously does affect the curriculum, which is what I've spent most of my time talking about, but there is a broader context than that too. And this is where um, it matters that the discipline of comparative philology arose um, in a fundamentally colonial context, especially the study of the global South. Right, or with respect to, I should put, the study of the global South. So again, this is me talking about the material that is closest to me that affects me most kind of materially. Um, I'll, talk, I'll use again Indology, that is the study of India and Sanskrit as an example here. So back to the 19th century, in the earlier stages of the discipline, Indigenous knowledge, this is indigenous knowledge of any community. Actually, this, this is a criticism which applies broadly to many fields of various studies. The idea is that indigenous knowledge, the knowledge of colonized peoples, is something that is extracted by European philologists, and they're the ones who then do the research, right? So you have that, whatever, you know, the, 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 the kind of inherited knowledge of Sanskrit was in India in the 18th century, it's extracted by Orientalists like, uh, well, William Jones, but then I've got Mueller, 
um, uh, Whitney, Monia, Monia Williams, um, and, and then of course the, the Germanic philologists, right, who are very, I mean, you know, on the one hand you have Jones who was actually, you know, uh, very much active in the legal subjugation of, of Indians, and you have people like Mueller who never even went to India, right, so the point is that these are the people who are really, you know, the, the fathers of the discipline, um, not the people, not the pundits who they kind of actually went and got the, these texts out of, right, got them to recite. Um, and this is a reasonably kind of, this is replicated across, um, uh, across various uh, parts of various empires. Um, the Hindu intellectual, this is going back to Sanskrit, the Hindu intellectual tradition does continue on its own trajectory. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a whole research project um, in Cambridge now on the continuation of Vedantic um, philosophy in the context of British colonialism. But what matters is that the version of Indology that appears in the Western academe, the version that feeds into comparative philology via classics, is divorced from this, right? And this situation is different from that with Latin and Greek. The kind of extract, marginalize, colonize is a very, is not quite, just doesn't work in quite the same way um, with, with Latin and ancient Greek. Okay, that was the 19th century. What about today? Well, it's, it's not an accident that we have this kind of centering of Latin and ancient Greek. I mean, yes, there's many factors that tie into the uh, institutional power that classics has, and it being basically the only study of ancient languages that has so much political kind of capital as to be offered in so many universities in Europe and North America. But clearly, this is not something that's independent of colonialism. It's very much part of it. Um, on a slightly more nuanced level, and this is something where it is hard to, to kind of um, break it down in a very clear way in terms of um, uh, nice quotable pithy examples, but there is an inherited form of othering which sees the legacy of, again, for example, Sanskrit in India as fundamentally irrelevant. It is fundamentally relevant to Sanskrit as studied from the perspective of Indo-European linguistics, right? Once you have extracted the Vedic texts from whoever it was that was still reciting them, you don't really care, right? You, it, there's, no, there's no sense of, oh, our past, our influences, you know, maybe some kind of romanticized, exoticist kind of Indomaniac kind of, uh, uh, kind of romantic like version, oh, you know, Mahabharata is great, that kind of thing. But from the actual kind of, the way that you're doing comparative philology, this is something which, there's just a mismatch here. Now, I will say this absolutely needs to be said, right? Because it's it's so present in the, I mean, it's important independently, but it's also present in culture, in, in current discussions about classics. Clearly there is a parallel here with the situation with Greek, right? When you still have absurdly British classicists saying that the Parthenon marbles should be kept in, in the British Museum, right? There's clearly, there's still that idea of, well, you know, we've got it now. And whoever the modern Greeks are, and I put that in, 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 in quotations because it, seems silly to have to specify, but whoever the modern Greeks are, well, you know, that, that's, that's divorced from the ancient Greeks. But there's a different kind of relationship there because that is a move of saying, oh, we, the white British, are the inheritors of the classical tradition and the ancient Greek tradition, which is not what the argument that's made with, with Sanskrit or, or, or other oriental studies, because it's not, oh, we're the inheritors, it's just that, you know, they're not capable of studying themselves, basically, is the point here. And, what that leads to on a structural scale is a substantial imbalance between the participation of scholars who are currently in the global south, who are at universities in the global south, and this is again, we're sort of zoomed out again here, rather from India. Um, they're not in, involved in this field in the same way that you have scholars from Europe and North America because of this colonial context and the way that, that, that the field um, arises. Um, and here we go, there's the conclusion from that, which is that it implicitly, in doing this, in, in having a, a field which is structured in that way, it continues a legacy, even if, even if you know, it's not something that people say. I mean, people, I mean, I've been in conferences where people more or less have said that, where you have a white scholar saying, oh, I have no stake in this debate about something about an Indian text, but the point being, you have this legacy in which white European and American scholars occupy a distinct intellectual position from those for whom, for example, back to Sanskrit, the Rig Veda is a sacred text as well as an object of unique and historical, uh, unique historical and linguistic interest. Right? So consider by way of comparison, the position of biblical studies where, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a kind of mix of people for whom these are sacred texts and for, for whom they are, they are not. Right? Um, 
And I'm now coming on to the kind of final stages, which is, well, what about us? Why, why do we need to have a, a, a society for classicists of color in Oxford, right? And part of the, the part that comparative philology plays in, in, in this kind of intellectual marginalization is that when you do have, you know, uh, second generation, first generation immigrants um, uh, who go through uh, the university system in these countries, this colonial hangover, this idea of these distinct intellectual positions, even if it's not overtly racialized, uh, sometimes, a lot of the time in the 21st century, it's still something that is perceived, right? It's, you know, there's a reason why there's not very many non-white comparative philologists who go beyond doing it as one undergraduate module. Right? There's a reason why, you know, I, I don't personally know anyone senior to me. I mean, they, I'm sure that there is someone, I hope there is. But personally, I don't know any people who do in my field, really, um, who, who aren't white, not personally. Um, so clearly there's something that, that, that does not happen in here. And more broadly, this is compounded by the existence of structural institutional racism at large. I'll give the UK universities and I'll name drop Oxford and Cambridge, but it's not unique to, to us, of course it isn't, but that's where we are. And, and you know, we, we, um, we start with our own house, right? Um, the upshot of this, because I've strayed far from comparative biology, but I've tried to make that point that, this, that there is a kind of continuing legacy here that ties into a larger scale problem in terms of modern universities and, and the way students of color um, in, in uh, European North American universities and the experience they have. So my conclusion is that comparative philologists must support general institutional anti-racist measures, right? This is about who we admit, it's about crucially who you hire, but then also things like, you know, general and more general anti-racist initiatives, you know, as a comparative philologist, if you're if you're if you're really serious about having a more decolonial and anti-racist and just more more equitable version of comparative philology, you have to care about these these general measures, right? And 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 in fact, I've actually gone and put this on another slide and said basically the same thing again because um, I just bear saying, you know, I, it's nice to talk about things that we know about and to, to, you know, say, oh, Sanskrit is good and valuable and deserves this respect or whatever, but that's not going to solve the problem, right? There are huge institutional problems um, that lead to the marginalization of among, among many demographics, scholars of color, right? And the fact that a lot of the most pressing institutional changes that need to happen to address this does not make it less of an issue for comparative apologists. You can't say, oh, well, you know, um, there's no white comparative, there's no non-white comparative philologist because, you know, we just don't get enough non-white people studying classics and we just don't get enough non-white people coming to the university, right? It all joins up, right? And this is part of the kind of general, uh, general thing that we should all really believe, which is that anti-racism um, is a collective duty. It's not a, 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 a kind of managerial duty, it's a collective, collective duty. Um, and in a bit to lighten the mood, I put tree beard on the screen here i am um, i uh, realize having decided to include this that um, talking to an audience of philologists I'm, i have to include the disclaimer that the dialogue i'm going to quote here um does not come from the book but it's in the film in peter jackson's adaptation um where if you imagine tree beard as comparative philology personified in this context uh, there's a point when he's deciding the answer deciding what to do about Saruman doing evil things and Tribute says oh well you know this isn't our war we must weather the storm as the ants always have done right and it's very easy as a comparative philologist to say well look this is what we do you know we, we just I just really want to know you know what the original form of the relative pronoun was in put into your peer you know I'm not a political person which I echo Mary Brandybuck's words which are you are part of this world right you're part of this world if you're a comparative philologist you're part of this world and, and you have to have to care not only for all of the uh, intellectual and curriculum based reasons that I've said, but you have to be committed to anti racism at institution level. There's simply no way that you can be serious about doing any kind of decolonial work if it's not also matched by this sort of commitment. So um, I will uh, at this point stop myself and I'll say thank you very much for coming. I have some conclusions. Um, which I will just stick up on the slide there for what we can do, which is something I promised I would say, what, what can we do? Um, but I won't talk through them um, because my time is up. So I'd like to take the opportunity once again to say thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, yes, we have time for questions, which I believe will not be recorded. Um, so yes, thanks very much. And uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. <laughs>